Welcome to Ashen and Focus Weekend Edition. I am Dr. Kaloy Tabunda from the Development Academy of the Philippines. The Foreign Service Institute, or FSI, is part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and was formally established under Presidential Decree 1060 on December 9, 1976. With the promulgation of Republic Act 7157, or the Philippine Foreign Service Act of 1991, the mandate of the Institute was revitalized and expanded as follows. The Institute, through its academic, training, research, information, publication, systems development, and other programs, shall serve as a center for the development and professionalization of the career core of the Foreign Service of the DFA and other government agencies which have offices and employees ass assigned abroad. It shall maintain the Center of International Relations and Strategic Studies or CIRSS and shall otherwise function as a research institution on issues and problems with foreign policy implications. Today in Ashen in Focus Weekend Edition, we are very much honored to have as guests no less than the Institute's Deputy Director General Julio S. Amador III who will shed light on FSI's activities as well as those related to ASEAN matters. Mr. Amador was appointed as Deputy Director General by President Benigno Aquino III on June 4, 2014 upon the nomination of the FSI Board led by Secretary Albert F. Del Rosario. Mr. Amador was a Fulbright Scholar at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs of Syracuse University where he earned a Certificate of Advanced Studies in Security Studies and a Master of Arts in International Relations. He earned his BA in Public Administration from the University of the Philippines. Deputy Director General Amador received an Australian Leadership Award to attend an intensive training program at the University of Queensland Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect. He was also an Asian Studies Visiting Fellow at the East-West Center in Washington and has given lectures and presented papers in academic and policy conferences in Australia, the US, Canada, the UK, Europe, and Southeast Asia. He was supporting expert at the East Asian Vision Group 2 and was Dame Gillian Sackler World Leadership Forum Fellow at the World Leadership Forum in 2013. Welcome to the program, Director Julio Amador. Thank you, Dr. Tabunda. So we're schoolmates from the University of the Philippines National College of Public Administration and <laughs> Governance. Yes, okay. we are. Before we go further, what is this uh, University of Queensland Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect? What is this? Well, the United Nations adopted uh, this concept called the Responsibility to Protect, which okay. is essentially the protection of nation states against mm -hmm. war, uh, what's considered uh, very heinous crimes, no? Mm -mm, um, crimes against humanity, okay. ethnic cleansing, mm -mm. Uh, genocide, genocide, and other war crimes. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it means that if states fail to protect their citizens, their peoples from these war crimes, then at some future event, the international community must be able to come in. However, okay. it has several aspects to it, which means we must help nation states prevent, mm -mm. in fact, the commission of these war crimes. So it's still a very much disputed uh, concept within mm -hmm. the international and even the scholarly community. Okay, so this is based in Queensland, Australia. Yes, it was an uh, intensive program for several government officials. Okay. You are the De Deputy Director General of FSI, and FSI is the institute, training institute for diplomats. Yes, it is. Um, but just to clarify, mm -hmm. it has two main functions. No? Mm -hmm. The first is the training function, of course, which mm -hmm. is essentially to provide the continuing prof professionalization program mm -hmm. for not only for the officers, but also for the staff of the Department of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. as well as for those attached agencies who send uh, officials abroad, These like attaches, 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 labor, attaches, labor okay. defense, intelligence, attaches, mm -hmm. and the like. Now, the second function mandated under Republic Act 7157 mm -hmm. is providing policy and research advice and mm -hmm. support to the Department of Foreign Affairs and its mm -hmm. various offices. Mm -hmm. Uh, the center, min uh, the institute maintains the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies, which mm -hmm. has several sections under it that deal with traditional security issues, mm -hmm. non-traditional security issues, and area studies such as mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, the United States, mm -hmm. China, Japan, as well as international organizations such as ASEAN and the UN. Mm -hmm. Now, just to highlight 
Sears was named by the Lauder Institute of the University of Pennsylvania mm. as one of the top ranking wow. think tanks in international relations in Southeast Asia and the okay. Pacific. Okay, wow. Okay, uh, being a diplomat is, uh, you know, carries with it a very uh, prestigious uh, reputation. So how does one become a diplomat? For example, I'm a, f I'm a fresh graduate from college and I intend to become a diplomat. So uh, how can I enter? Uh, how can I enter the, the diplomatic core through FSI? Well, just also to make it clear, I am not a diplomat myself. Okay. <laughs> My, I <laughs> At am, least you're training diplomat. I am an analyst by okay. profession mm -hmm. and I also teach international relations on the side. Mm -hmm. But essentially, um, every diplomat who passes the Foreign Service Officers Exam, mm -hmm. which is reputed to be one of the toughest mm -hmm. exams in the Philippines, mm -hmm. must pass through FSI because under okay. the law, they must undergo what is called the Foreign Service Officers Cadetship Course, mm -hmm. which is a one-year program, six months of which are intensive classroom and workshops at the FSI, mm -hmm. and six months again of an on-the-job training with the Department of Foreign Affairs. So how do they become diplomats? Mm -hmm. Well, they have to first take uh, an exam which is composed of several parts. No? There's a qualifying exam, which is basically an equivalent to the civil service professional exam. Th these are offered only to college graduates? Yes. Okay. And of course, then after that, you need, need to take a written uh, initial interview exam mm -hmm. and then a written exam in world history, mm -hmm. Philippine politics and governance, international mm -hmm. economics, and a language examination. And then after that, you need to pass through, I think, uh, you need to pass through an oral examination Mm -hmm. which is essentially group dynamics and, mm -hmm. of course, where you, we, we give some e e extemporaneous mm -hmm. uh, remarks in a dinner organized by the Board of Foreign Service mm -hmm. examinations. And after which you have to pass through a psychological exam. Which is very important. <laughs> which is very important <laughs> be, be, because, of course, you yeah. are re trying to recruit, recruit the best and the brightest the best into the, the service. Brightest. So these are young, uh, actually, most of them are fresh from college? Not necessarily because uh, being a foreign service officer will require some degree of maturity. Okay. So the Department of Foreign Affairs has been is, uh, strengthening its mm -hmm. standards in terms of who gets to t pass the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, I would believe right now that there is a requirement that you must at least have two years experience mm -hmm. and you are encouraged to acquire an advanced degree before you enter the service. This okay. is part of developing the professionalization of the mm -hmm. core of foreign service officers. Any age requirement? I think there's no age requirement, but okay. most the uh, median age for the past years have been around 25. Okay. So they enter through a cadetship. How long is this cadetship program? So once they pass the exam, mm -hmm. they must be appointed by the president to oh. get their commission. So okay. it's called a commission. They mm -hmm. get a commission, and then when they are commissioned, they have to swear, of course, an oath of office, mm -hmm. and then they are given to us to train for, for six training. months. And the, so the cadetship exam mm -hmm. is the equivalent of passing through a management development mm -hmm. program in uh, mm -hmm. the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, you might notice that it takes, uh, it's actually a quite a short program considering mm -hmm. that the responsibilities of a mm -hmm. diplomat are quite huge. No? So you spend four years to train one lieutenant, but you mm -hmm. actually only invest around six months in okay. training a uh, foreign service officer class four. Okay, so after the six months training, where do the graduates go? So. The six months training is what we call an in-service uh, in training program where everyone is given a, a very intensive approach to international relations, the practice of diplomacy, um, negotiations and consular matters including assistance to nationals. And then they are assigned to the Department of Foreign Affairs where they serve in the various offices, administrative, geographic um, and other principal offices of the department. So they spend six months there but essentially that uh, the time that they spend there will be the, or the office where they spend their, their on-the-job training will probably be the office where they will stay for the next uh, two to three years before they are eligible for their first assignment. Uh, okay, so after that two to three years, 
the first assignment, when you say first assignment, this is out of the country? Yes, foreign already. assignment. Okay. So they can be appointed as or designated as vice consuls mm -hmm. uh, and of course additional functions as economic or political mm -hmm. or cultural officers mm -hmm. in whatever post that they are given. No? Who determines their, uh, how is their assignment uh, determined? So I believe that it's in a process of uh, bidding where mm -hmm. there are available positions and mm -hmm. you get to compete but the recommending authority for that, the recommending body within the Department of Foreign Affairs is the Board of Foreign Service Administration. Okay, uh, we now go to the policy and research uh, support uh, uh, under the CIRS. Or we, so call it, we call it SEERS. SEERS, so what does SEERS specifically do? What are its activities now? Nowadays, uh, SEERS has been recognized by the department as a crucial partner in providing mm -hmm. research support mm -hmm. to the various offices of the department. So first we conduct research studies on issues that affect foreign relations and mm -hmm. for the Philippines international affairs. That mm -hmm. involves, of course, the South China Sea, ASEAN, UN issues such as peacekeeping, mm -hmm. and of course keeping watch on countries such as critical countries such mm -hmm. as China, India, Indonesia, the U.S., and the rest of Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and the world. No, mm -hmm. in fact, we have around 20, 20 21 people to mm -hmm. keep watch on what's happening mm -hmm. <laughs> globally. And that's under Sears. Under Sears, mm -hmm. um, training is a different. The Carlos mm -hmm. P. Romoli School of Diplomacy mm -hmm. does the training programs. Mm -hmm. So Sears, uh, right? Uh, Sears analysts write their commentaries they are available on our website mm -hmm. at fsi.gov.ph mm -hmm. you can the public can download them for free mm -hmm. this presents non-official perspectives on issues of the day that may affect the philippines we also conduct in-depth studies and of course any studies that department may require of us okay so and it has been recognized as one of the best think tanks in yes. southeast asia in in, 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 Asia, in the whole world? No, it's, it's Southeast Asia. <laughs> we, Asia. Of okay. course, we, are, we want to aim for the world, <laughs> but uh, given the uh, constraints, however, I think we, were, we are doing our best. Mm -hmm. Part of our function also mm -hmm. is to serve as a platform for dialogue between what we call the track one, which is the official track of mm -hmm. the government, mm -hmm. and then track two, which is composed of scholars, acad uh, academicians, analysts, mm -hmm. and we try to bring them together so that there will be dialogue. No? Mm -hmm. um, we have two main avenues for public interface. Mm -hmm. The first is what we call the Mabini Dialogue Series. Mm -hmm. This is named after Apolinario Mabini, the first Foreign Affairs Secretary of the Philippines. Oh, can you please repeat that for the sake of our viewers who do not know that yet? Apolinario Mabini is, he is recognized <laughs> as the first Foreign Affairs Secretary of the Philippines. Okay, and so we remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and so we named the program after him. Mm -hmm. It is where we bring experts from the academe okay. or from other embassies or foreign ministries abroad, and they come here and they share their perspective mm -hmm. on various issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had experts on uh, U.S. foreign policy, mm -hmm. uh, international health, climate change. ASEAN, the UN, um, regional security, mm -hmm. and other issues, and they give a short talk, and mm -hmm. then there's a Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, I think people in government appreciate these opportunities yes. for briefings. Actually, I, I've attended several uh, <laughs> Mabine dialogues <laughs> already. And then the second one is what we call the Mangrove Forum on International Relations. Mm -hmm. Now, the Mangrove Forum on International Relations is our high-level foreign policy Forum. Why mangrove? <laughs> I am glad you asked that because that was also one of the questions that were asked when we first proposed this. Mm. Uh, people were thinking, is that an environmental yes, <laughs> pro program? But we said no because mm. if you look at the structure of, uh, of and other the ecosystem of a river, mm. uh, it always ends up um, in a mangrove area. Mm. No? So the mangrove area is where the river meets the sea, no? and that creates synergies that mm. opens up nutrients that and it's a whole ecosystem yes, by itself and mangroves sustain life mm. no so for us well i will leave it up to you where yes. you will describe the government as the river or is it the <laughs> sea it, for us a mangrove is like 
deficit, no? Mm -hmm. Where we encourage people from all sectors to come to a dialogue on matters affecting our foreign relations. Mm -hmm. And we hope that by such dialogue, mm -hmm. by such um, discussions, we will come up with new ideas. We mm -hmm. will sustain the discussion because what enriches policy is mm -hmm. always an exchange between mm -hmm. the practitioners and the academic experts. So these events are uh, advertised. So how, how can, uh, for example, I want to attend a Madbini dialogue or a mangrove forum. How do I get to know the schedules? So the, mang the mangrove forum is generally open to the public. Um, it's advertised. It's advertised on our website uh, and our Facebook page. So please mm -hmm. visit FSI mm -hmm. Philippines on Facebook and mm -hmm. also Twitter if you want to get mm -hmm. the latest. Mm -hmm. And it is advertised, and we invite everyone to join and regis they register and then join mm -hmm. but for the Mambini dialogues it can be a closed door event because sometimes mm -hmm. there are sensitive issues that may be discussed and sometimes an expert is not willing to face the public mm -hmm. because he might be sharing some information that may not be re relevant to the general public but mm -hmm. may be very useful for those in the government so i would like to read the mangrove forum is open to the public yes. and it's advertised in your website yes. in your facebook uh, fan page mm -hmm. So those who are interested to attend any of these uh, activities, it's open to the public, yes. the Mangrove Forum. Okay, when we come back, we will talk about FSI and its activities related to the ASEAN Community Building. We'll be back. Okay, we're back with the... Uh, Director Julio Amador of the FSI here. Uh, at this point, we're going to talk about the uh, role of FSI in the ASEAN region. The establishment of the ASEAN community is a very significant period in the region's history. What is the role of your organization in the ASEAN and how do you foresee the FSI vis-a-vis -vis the increased activity related to the building of the ASEAN community? Well, 2017 is a very significant year okay. uh, for ASEAN and for the Philippines. We are going to be the chair of ASEAN in 2017, um, just like what we did for APEC last, last year. Last year, 2015, okay. But also 2017 is significant for ASEAN because it is the 50th anniversary, 50th mm -hmm. founding uh, anniversary of ASEAN. So that's two events mm -hmm. for, uh, that's two uh, significant events for ASEAN for and for the Philippines. So the government is hoping that the general public will support the hosting of ASEAN precisely mm -hmm. because of the momentous occasion um, uh, for, for the region, for the regional association. Now what is FSI doing? We are going to support the aims of the Department of Foreign Affairs in promoting ASEAN, mm -hmm. uh, primarily of course to the general public. That's why we conduct briefings on ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And on our website we have this um, quarterly update, what we call Sharing ASEAN. These mm -hmm. are important statistics. This website is the FSI, FSI Yes, FSI. Separate from the... Uh, .ph. Separate from the, uh, the DFA, DFA website. Yes. Website. Okay. Um, just to um, go back to the structure, the mm -hmm. Secretary of Foreign Affairs is mm -hmm. the chairperson of the FSI board. Okay. But we maintain a separate website mm -hmm. for our events. So, if, if you would like updates on ASEAN, please visit our website. We have this regular publication mm -hmm. called Sharing ASEAN. Mm -hmm. Now, next year we will be hosting the deans and directors of ASEAN plus three countries. Mm -hmm. um, that's FSI's top contribution to the hosting of ASEAN. Can you say that again? The annual meeting of the deans and directors of ASEAN plus three okay. uh, countries. So these are ASEAN countries plus China, Japan, and South mm -hmm. Korea. So they will be coming here to the Philippines and my Director General Ambassador Claro Cristobal will be hosting their meeting as well as a conference to discuss developments and exchange thoughts on training diplomats in ASEAN region plus China, Japan and South Korea. And other than that we will be hosting regular mangrove forums and Mabini dialogues. In the past we have already done this, we have had for example, two former Secretary Generals, Ambassador Rodolfo Severino of the Philippines, mm -hmm. and of course, um, the Honorable His Excellency Surin Pitsuan, okay. who was also the Secretary, previous, previous Secretary, General. Uh, Secret, uh, Secretary General, and they gave very enlightening talks on the future of ASEAN at mm -hmm. FSI's Mangrove Forum. Mm -hmm. So we foresee ourselves contributing to the policy and academic discussions mm -hmm. on ASEAN issues in support mm -hmm. of our chairmanship. 
Okay, so you, you help in creating awareness on ASEAN. Can you give us your honest assessment on, you know, how aware are the, Fili are the <laughs> Filipinos now on ASEAN? There was a survey, I forgot the exact name of the survey, mm. but we are uh, the, among the least aware, if yes. not the least aware among ASEAN Actually, there countries. was a survey 2007, I think. I think that in, was uh, the same one. We're just next to Myanmar. <laughs> and you can excuse Myanmar <laughs> for yeah, being you can excuse un Myanmar. unaware. But that was uh, eight years, uh, nine years ago. So do you think, is there a new survey on awareness? I am not aware, but you know, Last year alone, we mm -hmm. had to do a lot of briefings yes. in government agencies, mm -hmm. in universities, mm -hmm. um, in b various fora mm -hmm. on ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And it's not even a question of, you know, what are our plans, mm -hmm. what are our contributions. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is ASEAN? Yes, yes. Which, well, it, it is quite sad because mm -hmm. it tells you about the state of awareness. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also, I would prefer to look at it as an opportunity and mm -hmm. I would like to congratulate your network for giving attention to ASEAN. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please, uh, uh, well, we, we accept we, the credit. <laughs> we, we, take, we always try to keep note of those mm -hmm. institutions mm -hmm. which provide ASEAN mm -hmm. awareness and I think you are one if not the Actually, only. We are the only network <laughs> which have a radio and a TV program dedicated. devoted solely to ASEAN matters. So I think this is a great contribution mm -hmm. to ASEAN mm -hmm. awareness and I hope people will be more aware about mm -hmm. ASEAN because mm -hmm. In time, you know, ASEAN may be moving slowly, but in time, we will see quite a lot of mm -hmm. developments in the region. Mm -hmm. Just look at us. We are a region of around more than 600, 600 million, million. No, one of the largest yeah. economies in the world we combined. We are now the fourth, I just, I think, uh, four, uh, in 20, uh, several years from now, we will be the fourth largest economy. Yes, in precisely. The whole world. And more or less, our domestic policies mm -hmm. in some, at some point in the future will have to align with our agreements yes. at the region mm -hmm. and the region alone there's a lot of issues there are a lot of issues that need to be discussed mm -hmm. no? labor migration issues mm -hmm. cooperation on climate change um, pandemic issues health mm -hmm. issues so I think awareness we are far, so far behind but it doesn't mean that we should not continue this yes. process of making people aware of ASEAN as a regional community. And one of the sad things now, uh, it's campaign season for yes. the presidential and, and local elections and ASEAN is not even in the, you know, in the antenna of any of the, uh, <laughs> in any of the candidates. So what can you say about this? Well, I'm a government employee, <laughs> so I can't say anything particularly about the candidates, but mm. uh, let me point out that whoever wins the election will be the chair of ASEAN mm -hmm. uh, will head the Philippines mm -hmm. in its chairmanship of ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So whoever is elected and sworn in at the uh, in June, mm -hmm. he will have to lead the preparations and the implement uh, and you know the chairing of ASEAN in 2017. Mm -hmm. So he barely has six months mm -hmm. yes. to, to move the process okay. forward. Yeah. And as you know, well know from APEC. Mm -hmm. This is not just a simple yes. thing. There are a lot of prep preparations mm -hmm. involved both in the operational mm -hmm. side and the substantive side. So who should be taking uh, lead in, in creating the, this awareness? Well, according to the setup in ASEAN, mm -hmm. your information agency should be taking the lead in making people more aware. Mm -hmm. But I think that has to be integrated with educational uh, with, with what the Department of Education does and even CHED. No? Mm -hmm. um, we have a commitment under the previous blueprints to promote ASEAN studies mm -hmm. and by the way I think you have one yeah. the sole ASEAN studies uh, center in I the like country. To, uh, I would like to announce <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> that the New Era University has the only ASEAN Studies Center in the Philippines <laughs> yes. compared to other countries. You know, uh, last week I was in China with the uh, other directors of uh, ASEAN Studies Center and they told me specifically in uh, Thailand and in Indonesia, they, in, in, in Indonesia they have dozens of ASEAN Studies Center, also in, uh, in Thailand. Sadly, in the Philippines we only have one. Okay, so that speaks a lot on how we uh, how aware we are and how we value our, our membership yes. of the ASEAN community. <laughs> and, and, but it doesn't mean that we don't have experts on ASEAN. We have, no? we have we people have. like Dr. Carolina Hernandez, mm. Professor Herman Kraft, mm. one of my colleagues at FSI, Professor Rowena Leador, who heads mm. Sears. Mm. Uh, these are the people who have the academic 
and background knowledge about ASEAN issues. Government side, we have, of course, Ambassador Severino, officials at the DFA and various government agencies. But it seems sad that despite a lot of people, um, you know, in the government and in the academia who know a lot about ASEAN, the awareness about this regional organization, this regional association is quite low. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where the problem was, but I prefer to see this as an opportunity for not only for FSI and mm -hmm. for uh, Net25, but also for you know, the society as a whole mm -hmm. to really engage in a discussion mm -hmm. about ASEAN, because that is where our future is going mm -hmm. to be. Okay, so what do you think, how should we market ASEAN? How do we make ASEAN a uh, marketable, uh, marketable uh, agenda <laughs> in the Filipinos' uh, uh, consciousness? <laughs> I always tell my students that we now have two citizenships. No? Mm -hmm. You are a, a Filipino citizen, but you're also an ASEAN citizen. Mm -hmm. And one evidence of this is that whereas before, as you know, international travel is quite mm -hmm. a tedious affair. Yes. Nowadays, you just need to book one of those uh, seat sales, yes. grab your passport, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go to any ASEAN country. You have Without around any visa. <laughs> yeah, 20 to 30 days to mm -hmm. roam around, do yes. whatever it is that you mm -hmm. like, and then come home. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that tells you about mm -hmm. ASEAN. That is going to be the future, no? mm -hmm. seamless movement, mm -hmm. pro hopefully, of goods, mm -hmm. services of people. Mm -hmm. um, we should expect more foreigners or fellow ASEAN citizens mm -hmm. to be here and for us to be more mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you're going to make ASEAN more marketable, marketable <laughs> but essentially we have to do something about it because I don't even see any move on institutionalizing a basic course on ASEAN uh, in many universities, mm -hmm. which is which has been one of the recommendations by the leaders of ASEAN. Actually, there's an ASEAN university network which I think sh should uh, attend to this. But I, I don't feel it so far. I'm also a member of the academy and I don't feel it so far. <laughs> it, it has only three members for the Philippines, yes. no? UP, De La Salle, and Ateneo. But mm -hmm. uh, I think they have to expand that network. And we beat them into establishing <laughs> the ASEAN Studies <laughs> Network. Okay, we will talk more on FSI's involvement with building of the ASEAN community when we come back. <laughs> Mga tumatakbo sa pagkapresidente sa May 9, 2016. Jojo Binay, una. Miriam Defensor Santiago, PRP. Rodi Duterte, PDP Laban. Grace Poe, Independent. Mar Rojas, Daang Matawid, LP. Roy Senyeres, WPPPMM. Isang paalala mula sa Commission on Elections. Tamang pagboto, tamang pagbilang. From Eagle News Service, Singapore Bureau, this is Francis Rosido, I am one with 25. This is Trisha Kino, ABC correspondent, reporting from Calgary, Canada. I am one with 25. From Eagle News Service, CDLA Bureau, I am one with 25. From the Eagle News Service, Northern California Bureau, I am one with 25. From Moscow, Russia, we are one with 25. Mata ng Agila Weekend, Sabado, alas 6 hanggang alas 7 ng gabi. Ngayong linggo, dalawang kupunan ang magsasagupan. Susubukan na lakas at tapang ng bawat isa. The battle begins! <laughs> we will be the victors! <laughs> Makakatikim ng ano? Tama! Tama! Makakatikim ng ganito kataming pagkain! Ayan, oh! oh. Magkakaan ko na kayo. Sige. Yes, 
Eagle News International Weekend Edition, Saturday, 9 to 10 p.m. Better traction, more versatility. The new Audi A4 All-Road Quattro. For the first time, an all-wheel drive with Audi's Ultra Technology, ready at any time. Spanish Intensity. The Seat Leon Cupra ST290. The powerful sports car is now available as a racy station wagon. Drive it. Moments, Sabado, alas 7 hanggang alas 8 ng gabi. Okay, we're back with our interview with the Director Amador of the FSI. We continue with our discussions on FSI's activities related to uh, the Philippine hosting of ASEAN in 2015, 2017. 2017, sorry, and at the same time, it is also the 50th anniversary, anniversary. of ASEAN. It, it will be hosted by, by yes. no less in the Philippines. Okay, you mentioned about the annual meeting of deans and directors of ASEAN plus three as one of your main activities. What is this? So. This is the first time that the Philippines is going to host the annual meeting of the deans and directors of the diplomatic academies of mm -hmm. ASEAN plus three countries. Uh, so FSI and its counterparts mm -hmm. in, in ASEAN countries as well as China, Japan, mm -hmm. and South Korea are coming to the Philippines. We will be hosting them and we will organize a conference with them mm -hmm. to exchange ideas on how to train mm -hmm. uh, diplomats, uh, basically. Okay. And that is... FS, uh, one of FSI's main activities. We will be also, on the research side, we will be chairing with China the network of ASEAN China think tanks. Okay. This is a network of those research and policy institutions that study um, ASEAN issues and China issues mm -hmm. and we're coming together because um, this year is the 25th year anniversary of the ASEAN-China yeah. uh, dialogue partnership. That's one right? of the activities <laughs> I uh, attended in China last week. So the, 25th, the International Conference uh, commemorating the 25th anniversary of the ASEAN-China dialogue, something like that. <laughs> so we are hosting the what we call the country coordinators meeting okay. and the conference next year on what we call the NACT. Mm -mm. That's, an, that's our activity on the research side. Mm -hmm. In between, we will be holding several Mabini dialogues, mm -hmm. um, mangrove forums. We will be trying to invite high-level personalities to give mm -hmm. a talk on what their perspectives on ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have that book project that we're yes, working yes. on, on the role of the Filipino ASEAN at and 50. the yeah. Philippines in, Ase mm -hmm. in ASEAN mm -hmm. the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. So we've been, we're going to invite experts mm -hmm. to share their perspectives on mm -hmm. the future of ASEAN, mm -hmm. the past, the challenges, mm -hmm. but emphasizing mm -hmm. what we have done as, mm -hmm. as Filipinos and the Philippine nation's role in ASEAN. So watch out for that book. We will be publishing the Development Academy of the Philippines jointly with FSI. Who else? I, uh, I think we're the two The PIDS, yes. the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. And there's another volume with the UP uh, CIDS. CIDS Center for uh, Integrative, Integrative Development, Development Studies. Studies. We'll be coming up with a book commemorating the 50th anniversary of ASEAN, ASEAN and the Philippines' perspective yeah, on yes. what it has done so far during the 50 years of ASEAN and what are the prospects in, in the next many years or so. Definitely. Okay. So what do we expect from this annual meeting of deans and directors? So we're talking here of uh, the 10 uh, ASEAN. ASEAN member states plus three. So. How long will this be and what's the uh, agenda for this uh, annual meeting? This is a two-day meeting okay. and this is a regular forum for the mm -hmm. deans and directors of diplomatic academies to mm -hmm. exchange ideas and share mm -hmm. their, ex their experiences mm -hmm. on developing diplomats, mm -hmm. um, developing their capacity, developing their understanding mm -hmm. of various issues that affect the function of a foreign service mm -hmm. officer. And so um, we offered to host that as part mm. of our activities mm. for the 50th year of ASEAN. So okay. last um, this year, it is Korea that is chairing, Ooh. and my boss will be going to Seoul mm -mm. to attend that one. Last year, it was Indonesia's mm -mm. Um, turn, no. turn. So we said we wanted to do it in the mm -mm. In, in the 50th year of ASEAN. Okay. Uh, Director Amador here has been volunteered, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> to become a member of the Board of Advisors of the New York University ASEAN Studies Center. 
so far the first and only Asian Studies Center in the Philippines. Uh, as a member of the board, what are your uh, proposals for a, you know, for a vibrant Asian Studies Center? Well, thank you very much for <laughs> volunteering me to be a member of the ASEAN <laughs> Studies Center Board. It's my honor to be a mm -hmm. member mm -hmm. because I believe, um, and I will discuss this later, I believe mm -hmm. the idea of a community of nations mm -hmm. within the region. Mm -hmm. And I think our role at the ASEAN Studies Center is to continue mm -hmm. creating awareness, but at mm -hmm. the same time, being a venue for discussion mm -hmm. among different so sectors of society mm -hmm. on the future of ASEAN, especially mm -hmm. on the role of Filipinos, mm -hmm. because we're very much affected by what's going to happen in yes. ASEAN. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we have to consider when we discuss ASEAN is the future of education, for example, mm -hmm. where we will encourage our Filipino mm -hmm. students to go around the region, spend a semester here, mm -hmm. and we will be inviting people from students from around the region mm -hmm. to visit and stay in various mm -hmm. universities. Mm -hmm. So that is part of the ASEAN awareness mm -hmm. um, program that mm -hmm. we should be having at yes. the ASEAN Study Center. And then, of course, there are various mm -hmm. issues that we need to discuss and host, mm -hmm. ho hopefully conferences, mm -hmm. workshops and lectures on climate change is issues, mm -hmm. labor and migration, mm -hmm. education issues, mm -hmm. um, other policy issues that affect us, mm -hmm. uh, not only as a country, but also as a member mm -hmm. of ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So the ASEAN Study Center right now, it's, it's housed in uh, the professional schools building of the New Era University. Right now, it is a learning resource center. We have books, uh, journals, and other publications, and video materials coming from from the 10 ASEAN member states, plus we also have materials coming from the ASEAN Secretariat uh -huh. in Jakarta and uh, from China, because there's an ASEAN China Center. And if there's an ASEAN Korea Center, we hope to get materials also from, from the ASEAN uh, Korea Center. You're talking of an uh, exchange program for students. H how about, uh, is it possible for us to, you know, to have visiting you know, professors uh, coming to ASEAN Study Center to share their expertise on, to share their views and expertise on ASEAN it, it is It's very much possible mm -hmm. and it doesn't really require much. Okay. Uh, most of the time it's just provision of office spaces and some administrative support because we have that. they usually <laughs> come here with their own funding no, to yes. conduct their mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. and they willingly give lectures mm -hmm. on issues affecting ASEAN mm -hmm. or the Philippines. So I think that's one of the things that we need to mm -hmm. give um, mm -hmm. enough attention to mm -hmm. and and in this day and age where we always say that the resources are difficult scarce, to come by, yeah, is yeah, scarce, yeah. then perhaps it's a way for us to mm -hmm. work together with mm -hmm. not only with FSI but also other universities and say, mm -hmm. hey, we have, uh, we have an ASEAN study mm -hmm. center, let's share mm -hmm. resources. You know, if you have a speaker here, mm -hmm. especially because a lot of the major universities are so far from Quezon City, yes. we can offer to organize a lecture mm -hmm. here. In the same way that if someone mm -hmm. comes here, we can offer to have them lectured there. I think mm -hmm. we need to stop that divide among <laughs> universities <Yeah>. and <laughs> because you know it, it's a little late in the game for us to raise mm -hmm. awareness on ASEAN but it doesn't mean that we should stop. I think it is our role to continue that at the ASEAN mm -hmm. Studies Center mm -hmm. so uh, that's one of the things that I will advocate for mm -hmm. that we really need to become that hub Mm -hmm. for discussion and dialogue on ASEAN issues. So particularly uh, so we have uh, uh, we're actually, we're scheduling monthly uh, for, for us for the Asian Studies Center. What are the topics you think should be uh, addressed more, more urgently by, by the Asian Studies Center? Well, of course, we need to give priority to awareness about mm -hmm. what our role will be in 2017 as we chair. What are the priorities of the various government agencies because we are also going to chair the environmental ministers mm. meeting, mm -mm. the science and technology ministers meeting, so there's a lot of issues okay. and perhaps you can invite uh, ranking officials from departments to give mm -mm. their perspectives on what their agencies will be doing for 2017. Mm -mm. But also I recommend that we invite academic experts mm -mm. from various universities to share their thoughts on ASEAN issues mm -mm. Um, because really we, one of the things that is always overlooked mm -mm. is the need to actually have people come together and discuss ASEAN. Mm -mm, no? mm -mm. Uh, I've been giving briefings around mm -mm. Metro Manila and generally around the Philippines on ASEAN issues and it mm -mm. saddens me that that yes. kind of awareness is missing, even in the capital city alone. Mm -mm. 
So that tells you a lot about the gap that exists. Mm -hmm. And this is not the time for us to be competitive, but this is mm -hmm. the time for us to, to, cooperate, to cooperate with each other. With each other. <laughs> and we're offering the Asian Studies Center as a uh, <laughs> venue, <laughs> as a platform, as, as a convergence uh, platform where all of these uh, academic institutions can, can come together to really talk and share on matters. Uh, related to Asian community. Okay, we will continue more with the discussion with the Director Amador here and our discussions will focus more on the Filipino as a dual citizen. We will be back. Okay, we're back with the Director Amador here. Uh, Dr. July Amador, okay. You mentioned earlier that the Filipino is now a dual citizen, a Filipino and an Asian citizen. Yeah. What do you mean by this? The good thing about this is it's not the most controversial second citizenship a Filipino can have, no? Okay. Because <laughs> we have committed to become a regional community, mm, no? Mm. It's an Asian community, yes, and yes. therefore you must be a member of that community. Mm. By being a Filipino, you're automatically mm. a member of ASEAN. So what I'm saying here is that we need to have a wider focus on identity. Mm -hmm. We need, you know, the thing about a Filipino is that he has a provincial identity, he has a sub-national identity, mm -hmm. you are Nilucano, Bicolano, mm -hmm. what have you. But now we gain a fourth one, an ASEAN an identity. ASEAN identity. Uh, that essentially means that, you know, we are now part of this wider community of mm -hmm. nations mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia. So we are citizens of ASEAN, and by virtue of being citizens of ASEAN, you gain values, rights, and yes. of course, uh, responsibilities. Yes. But foremost among these, of course, is the benefit of travel around the region, the mm -hmm. benefit of getting um, advantages that non-ASEAN citizens mm -hmm. will have. Mm -hmm. And the government is negotiating with various other, with the ASEAN member states to make ASEAN really a wider mm -hmm. community or mm -hmm. something that welcomes and, and community of nations that welcome everyone from Myanmar yeah. to uh, the Philippines. The labor no? mobility yes. aspect. Although Education. I think, uh, more uh, actions should be done on this, specifically in, uh, specifically in creating awareness on what labor mobility yes. is. Yes, because even in ASEAN alone, there's a divide. We mm -hmm. have labor sending, labor receiving mm -hmm. countries, mm -hmm. and so we're very much concerned about mm -hmm. that. So that's the uh, dual citizenship that are, we are talking about. No, being a citizen of of ASEAN does not take anything away from us. Mm -mm -mm. It, in fact, it only enriches our yes. identity as a mm -mm. Filip as a, as as Filipinos mm -mm. because we are a country that is known to have a lot of identities within mm -mm. us. But now we are getting in touch mm -mm. with those who share mm -mm. our common roots, no? our common neighbors, our common actually, neighbors, our, our yes. close, our very close door neighbors. Okay. Uh, but there are challenges, of course. Yes, One definitely. of them is uh, the Philippines sticks out of ASEAN because we are more, whether we accept it or not, we are more uh, uh, focused on America, the United States. The, the, we're closer to America culturally than, than with our closer neighbors. So how do you uh, comment on this? Well, I would say that the Philippines is really a melting pot of cultures. No, mm -hmm. uh, There's an argument by an author I think his book is 1521. Mm -hmm. um, he's a foreign author and he argued that globalization mm -hmm. would not have had, would not have happened mm -hmm. or it would not ha have gone into that scale without the Philippines. The okay. Philippines seems to be the fulcrum between the new world and the old. No? This is yes. where the Manila, Aca Manila Acapulco, uh, Acapulco. Acapulco Galleon trade mm -hmm. met the trade from Mm -mm. mainland China mm -mm. Yes, yes so there was an exchange and Manila was that hub mm -mm. that fulcrum of globalization mm -mm. Mm -mm. so does it mean that we focus on the US alone I, I don't think so okay it's just part of our history mm -hmm. no and mm. and we have taken a lot from the Americans but we haven't lost our mm -hmm. ASEAN-ness no our Asian-ness or mm -hmm. being a member of the Southeast Asian region I, I think I would see it more as it's not a disadvantage. Okay. In fact, we are the window of ASEAN to the rest of the world. Because we are the mm. more, you know, you find Filipinos mm. everywhere, right? Mm. We are very much cosmopolitans. We are citizens yes. of the world. And we open that up to mm. them. And, mm. and it also allows us to 
bring in the U.S. into the region, not mm -hmm. because the U.S. wants to be in this region, but because they've always been part of the region. Mm -hmm. Being a maritime nation, trade passes through us, ships pass mm -hmm. through our seas and our uh, waterways. So it should not come as a surprise that the Philippines mm -hmm. is facing west and facing yes. east. It is just that. Um, so it should not be seen as something disturbing. In fact, it is always an opportunity mm. for us. Okay, so what are the challenges you see in uh, the Filipino uh, acquiring this real Asian identity now? Well, one of the things that I've always believed is that misery loves company. No? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes this region can be miserable because of the natural disasters occurring. No? Mm -mm. If a typhoon passes through the Philippines, it inevitably yeah. goes through the rest of the ASEAN region. Vietnam, <laughs> Vietnam Myanmar, Myanmar. Uh, Cambodia, yeah. and an earthquake here may send tremors yeah. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That kind of you know, um, condition where we share in facing common challenges mm -hmm. should tell us that we cannot be indifferent mm -hmm. to people in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. Say, if there's a rice shortage somewhere in in Laos or mm. Indonesia, or there's a drought, or there was an accident, an earthquake. Mm. We have seen that in Yolanda, our mm. ASEAN neighbors were the first mm. to send help yes. and assistance, mm. were among the first to send assistance. And we should see that as an opportunity to mm. be able to be non-indifferent. Mm. No? We mm. cannot be indifferent. Mm. So if there's something happening there, we have to be concerned because mm -hmm. like most probably, Filipinos will be found in those nations. Mm -hmm. And we've always had a reputation of being good neighbors. No? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I see that as a way of promoting ASEAN citizenship mm -hmm. is that we look at these common problems. Mm -hmm. Another common problem, I, I think another issue that I would like to emphasize is this issue of pandemics, no? yes, diseases, yeah. infectious diseases, which know no boundaries. We had the SARS before. Yes, SARS, oh. and now you have Zika. Mm. So, you know, you travel from one airport, the, after mm. a few hours, mm. you're now in the next one. Mm -mm. That tells us that we need to share information. Mm -hmm. We need to share or we need to improve our customs, immigrations, and quarantine services. Mm -hmm. no? We need to share b lessons learned. We need to share best practices. Because we are confronting common challenges. Mm -hmm. Resource scarcity, marine environment, uh, the threats to the marine environment. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, coral bleaching is a reality now. Overfishing is a reality. Yes. But we share these resources. Mm -hmm. And like it or not, there will come a time when, you know, if these resources become scarce, what will happen? Do we fight over them? Mm -hmm. But if we have ASEAN as a platform for cooperation, then perhaps we have an opportunity to come mm -hmm. up with a plan mm -hmm. and implement this plan together for the mm -hmm. benefit of everyone. Okay. China. China. <laughs> That is a very <laughs> sensitive topic. <laughs> so what about China? <laughs> they say that China is dividing ASEAN. Uh, can you comment on this? <laughs> ASEAN has always prided itself in being a platform for dialogue among mm. great or major powers. Mm. No? One of its great successes has been to form um, several mechanisms such as the ASEAN Regional Forum mm. where foreign yeah, minist yes. ministers regularly meet to discuss mm. issues. And now we have the East Asian Summit. Mm -hmm. which is driven by ASEAN, it is a mechanism where all the leaders, in fact, it's the only mechanism where all the major powers of the world, the U.S., China, Russia, Japan, Australia, Australia India, South Korea, and then New Zealand, mm -hmm. come together every year to meet with ASEAN leaders to discuss security and economic issues. Mm -hmm. no? The G7 does not have that kind of setup. The UN Security Council, the permanent mm. one, does not have that kind of setup. We have that. So ASEAN, I think, has learned its lesson mm -mm. that a weak ASEAN, a divided ASEAN, does not benefit mm -mm. regional community building. Mm. I would like to believe that citizens of ASEAN member countries mm -mm. feel that there is usefulness in this one community because we have we're almost uh, on the same level right yes, um, yes. Uh, we are not very powerful countries in terms of the military mm -mm. some might be economic powers like Singapore but 
population wise it's mm -hmm. quite small so what we have here is this grouping of middle to small powers working mm -hmm. together to ensure that they survive in an era where major power dynamics seem to be mm -mm. returning. No? Mm -mm. The old geopolitical dynamics mm -mm. happening during the Cold War seems to be returning mm -mm. and ASEAN has a role in ensuring that those of us in the middle mm -mm. survive mm -mm. <laughs> or at least um, remain prog uh, progressive and mm -mm. peaceful even as this era unfolds. Another issue in ASEAN is of course the bridging the economic gap among the member yes. states you have uh, on one end Singapore uh, with the, one of the world's highest per, per capita GDP and you have Myanmar and CLMB yeah. except Vietnam now. Yes, so, yes. Uh, it's so, <laughs> yeah, you know. So, so how, how do you foresee this uh, proceeding in the next few years or so? ASEAN recognized that there is really a gap between the original ASEAN mm -hmm. And then, of course, Brunei with the CLMB. Mm -hmm. Vietnam is catching up. In fact, its economic growth is quite mm -hmm. high. So mm -hmm. you now have CLM. Mm -hmm. And Timor Leste has plans of joining ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So what are the, what is going to happen? We have the initiative for ASEAN integration, mm -hmm. where we mm -hmm. really help these countries move up. Because ASEAN's main goal is really to make this region more mm -hmm. prosperous for everyone. And all of these issues are being tackled but, but in, the, in the activities of FSI in the promoting the promotion of ASEAN uh, awareness? Given our resources and constraints, mm -hmm. yes, we hope we are mm -hmm. doing our share in oh, okay. ASEAN awareness. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Director Julio. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Tabunda. And we hope uh, you will be back soon in one of our future episodes. Okay. <laughs> it is my pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, FFI serves as a center for development and professionalization of Foreign Service Career Corps. It continues to hone homegrown talents for international, international service and takes pride in sending civil servants for mutual cooperation and collaboration. It plays a vital role in shaping the minds of international leaders who are knowledgeable about both national and regional issues, particularly in security, economics and trade and politics, and now with the ASEAN, uh, the building of the ASEAN community, and worsening effects of climate change and the overall goal of human development. It is high time to revisit the changing identity of Filipinos assigned in foreign service and, uh, and I know that FSI is at the forefront of these activities, okay? I'm Kaloy Tabunda from Net25 and I'm one with 25.